Have you ever wondered what is required to control small room acoustics? I'm not talking about digital signal processing. I mean directly addressing the problems themselves, physically and passively. I've designed hundreds of critical listening rooms from new construction to existing, and in this video I'll talk about the different disciplines that apply to small room acoustics from all the other types of acoustic spaces, specifically for the accurate reproduction of music and how these efforts work together to create a magical listening space. This episode is brought to you by AV Room Service, specializing in acoustic design services and products to optimize the performance of your room and equipment experience. Visit us at avroomservice.com or book a call to speak with me to see how I can help you get the most out of your room and gear. AV Room Service, the science of perfected sound. Performance venues are very different from critical listening environments. In addition, small spaces require different rules and approaches than large spaces. Performance venues require supportive acoustics, meaning appropriate reverberation times for the type of music being performed. Playback listening rooms are not to be supportive. They should not influence the sound waves destructively. The room should be practically inaudible, but not anechoic. There's a thin line from 20 to 20,000 hertz regarding reverberation control between coloring the sound and allowing it to be true and neutral to the recording. Everyone's room is acoustically unique in how it colors and alters and masks the sound received by the listener. They are as unique as our voices, our signatures, our fingerprints, this is not desirable, and no matter how great your equipment is, it cannot overcome poor acoustics. We have to organize acoustic chaos if we want mixes to translate well to other studios to get the most out of our playback equipment and the recording. We need an acoustically neutral environment. A little sidebar regarding digital signal processing. DSP is extremely limited in its applications and it's only a band-aid. Understand that DSP alters the original electrical signal. Understand also that once the electronic signal is converted by the loudspeaker and becomes an airborne sound wave, the room has control. In addition, each DSP algorithm is unique and sounds unique. I'm not saying DSP is not to be used. It has its applications. I'm just saying that it must be applied judiciously for the right reasons and, and its limitations understood. These days, I find it misused and overused. Back to small room acoustics. This category of small room critical listening acoustics involves many disciplines across many scientific fields. In 1964, physicist, academic, and author of many acoustic books, Robert Bruce Lindsay introduced The Science of Acoustics, a graphical representation that has become popular and often called the Wheel of Acoustics. Originally developed for the Acoustical Society of America as a means to, quote, evaluate the role and significance of acoustics in higher education and chart the future of education acoustics, unquote. It has since been added to and grown as a result of advancements in technology, legislation, and other developments and interests. Here, I've applied his chart to my own chart, showing the many areas of Lindsay's wheel that apply to what I do as a specialized acoustical engineer slash consultant. Note the shock and vibration and noise spread over mechanical and architectural, and room and theater acoustics span over architectural, visual arts, and music, and hearing and psychoacoustics fall under physiology and psychology, or what I would call human perception, which includes emotional responses. And from there, I made a chart as it applies to small room critical listening acoustics or control studios and playback rooms. Small rooms are containers of sound energy. 
However, they may also be subjected to noise inf infiltration from outside or inside equipment, HVAC and or electrical noise within the listening space, or transferring noise to adjacent spaces. These issues may apply to larger spaces to be sure. However, in small spaces, the listener is more likely to be annoyed by minor amounts of noise a, because the noise source is likely in proximity to the listener, and B, because the space is likely a low-level ambient noise floor, allowing the noise source to be easily heard. Small playback rooms serve a different function and require different acoustic methods of designing, modeling, and testing than do large spaces such as auditoriums. Changes in sound energy wavelengths in relation to the room's dimensions, as well as the time differences between direct and reflected sounds at the listening locations, are very different between large and small spaces. When I speak of small interior room volumes, I'm talking about anywhere from a few cubic meters, like that of an, an automobile, to several hundred, like that of a mixing room or listening room. Here we are dealing with individual room modes or resonances in the low frequency region, say below 250 hertz, in which wave acoustics prevail. In these small rooms, there are few room modes, so they draw attention to themselves, especially when they are frequency close to each other. In the mid-range, in the high frequencies, ray acoustics prevail. These are reflections from room boundaries, walls, floor, ceiling, and other objects that arrive within even milliseconds of the direct sound. They include both the early and the late reflection time periods. Early reflections can be perceived if they are too loud in respect to the direct sound in the amplitude domain and or they are delayed in arrival compared to the direct sound in the time domain. This is one example of where good, a good understanding of psychoacoustics is needed. Late reflections are known as reverberation, which masks low-level resolution, limits dynamic range, distorts spatial cues, etc. Note that reverberation covers the entire audible bandwidth. Other disciplines involve architecture, mechanical engineering, noise and vibration, etc. However, unique to small room critical listening environments specifically include sound propagation, the effects of source dispersion and interactions between the boundaries and the furnishings and their absorption, reflection, and diffusion character characteristics along the, their pathways to the listener. Also, design and application methods for sound field optimization and measurement equipment and techniques, modeling software, shell construction materials and methods, and physiological and psychoacoustical, psychoacoustic sciences. Additionally, loudspeaker time alignments, positioning, and angles are all intensified in small room spaces and must be attended to with much more care during setup and calibration. It is when the equipment room acoustic system is optimized that the suspension of disbelief, goose bumps, uncontrollable toe tapping, and even tears of emotion can cause joy and realization that the investment has paid off well. In another video, we'll talk more specifically about basic room acoustic goals regarding reverberation times, noise floor, reverb, or rather room mode distribution, and physical setup, calibration, etc. If you are curious about how to go about vetting an acoustical consultant, watch this video next, or just book a call with me in the link below. See you in the next video.